well, thank you all so much for joining us for the, uh, for the uh, Black Great Migration in New England. So author Blake uh, Gumpricht will uh, discuss his new book, North to Boston, Life Histories from the Black Great Migration in New England. Between World War II and 1980, tens of thousands of Black people moved to Boston from the South as part of the Great Migration one of the most consequential mass movements of people in American history. Black migration from the South transformed the city as it did urban areas across the country. And North of Boston is the first book to examine this important subject. So Blake, uh, a little bit about Blake. Blake taught geography for more than two decades at the University of New Hampshire, the University of South Carolina, and the University of Oklahoma. He's the author of two previous books, The Los Angeles River, Its Life, Death, and Possible Rebirth, and The American College Town. Uh, both of these books won the American Association of Geographers J.B. Jackson Prize. And Blake now lives and is joining us from El Paso, Texas. And I again want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring. So all uh, 60 of us who are watching live and the other hundred or so that will watch the uh, recording on demand. Let's give a big virtual round of applause to Blake for joining us here tonight. And Blake, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Robert. And thanks everybody that has joined us tonight. I will warn you in advance that this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. So I'm not an old pro, so uh, bear with me. Um, the migration of black people from the American South to cities in the North and West in the 20th century uh, as Robert said, uh, was one of the most consequential mass movements of people in U.S. history. It is called the Great Migration. Between World War I and 1980, more than six million Black people left the South and moved to urban areas in the North and West. Detroit's Black population increased 1,300 percent. New York City added 1.7 million Black residents, and Black people came up came to make up nearly 40% of Chicago's population. The Black exodus from the South dramatically altered the geography of Black America. Before World War I, nearly nine out of every 10 Black people in the US lived in the rural South, a legacy of slavery. By 1980, nearly half of Black people lived outside the South, most of them in cities. Much has been written about the Great Migration nationally, but its impact on Boston has been largely ignored, and the city is rarely mentioned in national studies of the subject. As a result, people often presume that Boston received few Southern migrants. In fact, I had multiple Black leaders in Boston question whether many Blacks came to the city from the South. I knew many did because I had the data to prove it. Boston received fewer Black Southern migrants than other Northern cities, probably because migrants traveling north along the eastern seaboard stopped first in other urban areas and stayed. But the volume of Black migration to Boston from the South was still sizable, and the impact was great. Boston's Black population increased 831% during the Great Migration. Not all of that was the result of migration from the South. Boston also experienced Black immigration from the Caribbean and Africa, but migration from the South was the most important factor by far. At the outset of the Great Migration, Black people made up just 2% of Boston's population. But by 1980, the city was nearly one quarter Black. Probably half of those people were born in the South or were the children or grandchildren of Southern migrants. Although historians date the beginning of the Great Migration to World War I, substantial movement of Black people to Boston from the South began earlier than that, probably owing to the city's reputation as a center for the abolitionist movement and its history as a sanctuary for people fleeing slavery. Boston was home to about 2,200 Blacks before the Civil War, but the movement of Black people to the city increased dramatically after the emancipation of slaves. Boston's Black population doubled by 1880 and doubled again by 1900 to more than 11,000 people. Most of the newcomers came from the South. That didn't last, however, probably because Black migrants discovered Boston's reputation for racial tolerance was exaggerated. Prejudice also increased. 
the historian Elizabeth Hafkin Pleck studying census returns found that few southern born black males who lived in the city in 1880 remained 20 years later. Many had left, likely disheartened by what they found. World War I was the initial impetus behind the Great Migration. The war created labor shortages in northern cities because many workers joined the military. Factories increased production to aid the war effort. And immigration largely stopped because of fighting in Europe. Black Southerners saw opportunity and moved more, and excuse me, and moved north. But Black migration to Boston from the South actually slowed in the first four decades of the 20th century even as it was exploding elsewhere. In fact, during the pivotal decade of World War I, the number of Southern born Blacks in the city actually declined. World War II changed everything. Demand for workers drove Black migration to unprecedented levels. Boston's Black population nearly doubled between 1940 and 1950. Almost half of the city's 40,000 Black people in that year were born in the South. Boston added 23,000 Black residents in the 50s and 41,000 in the 60s, many from the South. Black population growth changed Boston. Black people displaced white residents from Roxbury, Dorchester, and eventually Mattapan and Hyde Park. The southeastern third of the city became predominantly Black. Businesses catering to the Black population proliferated. Black churches increased in number and variety. Black people organized to demand better treatment, better jobs, and better schools. White residents, in turn, fled to the suburbs. At the dawn of the Great Migration, 98% of the city's residents were white. Today, white people make up less than half of the city's population. I examine the history of Black migration to Boston from the South in the introduction to my book, but the heart of my book is the 10 chapters that follow. Each of them tells the life history of a single migrant. Those individuals moved to Boston from 1943 to 1969 from six Southern states. I chose to tell the story of black migration to Boston in this way because it brings to life what happened better than a conventional historical narrative would. The story of migration is the story of people, individuals who risk everything in hopes of finding a better life. The best way to tell that story, in my view, is through the lives of the migrants themselves. I'm going to tell you a little about the 10 people featured in hopes that that will make you want to read more about them. Their lives are very much worth knowing. Charles Gordon was born in New Orleans and lived for the first few years of his life in Louisiana's capital, Baton Rouge. He recalls little about his life in the South, but he does remember the stories family would tell him about how black people were treated there. Those stories scared him. His family migrated to Boston in 1943. They knew nobody there. His father got a job at the Boston Naval Shipyard, which added tens of thousands of workers during World War II. The family moved into an apartment on Warwick Street in Roxbury. The street was inhabited entirely by black people and many were Southern migrants from Georgia, South Carolina, even as far away from Texas. The street, was mi the street was a microcosm of the Black South and showed the degree to which Black migration was changing Boston. But just as his parents suffered from racism in the South, Gordon experienced it in Boston. He attended junior high at the Sherwin School in Roxbury. The school was considered one of the worst in the city and was the object of protests by Black parents. Black leaders cheered when the school burned to the ground. In high school, he was kept off the varsity football team at Boston English because white coaches were trying to push a star Irish player for a college scholarship and feared Gordon would get more attention. He was refused a spot as a platoon leader in the annual Boston Schoolboy Cadets Parade, even though his high grades were supposed to automatically qualify him. There were no black platoon leaders because school leaders just didn't want to do it, he said. Gordon is strong-willed and describes his views on racial matters as militant. Still, he has largely kept his feelings to himself because he didn't trust his own temperament. I wasn't going to stand for you calling me the N-word, he said, and all that kind of stuff. I'm not nonviolent. No way. He also encountered discrimination as he became an adult and found that black workers were largely shut out of, of most jobs. Jews hired us, he said. Gordon's family was poor and that sometimes held him back. 
He had to drop out of Bentley College soon after he started because his father lost his job and Charles needed to help support his family. But Gordon was smart and that eventually enabled him to rise above his family's socioeconomic status. He attended the elite Boston English High School, one of two public high schools that required students to perform well on an exam to gain admission. After he dropped out of college, he worked for several years in the clothing industry, then went to technical school and earned a welding certificate. He worked for 22 years at a major defense contractor, General Dynamics, rising to become a department head. He began taking business classes part-time at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and eventually earned a bachelor's degree in management and economics. That enabled him to get a job at Harvard University as a facilities manager. He worked there for 14 years, retiring from one of the world's elite universities in 2002. Would that have happened if Gordon's family had remained in Louisiana? That seems highly unlikely. I never imagined that, he said. There was not one incident that prompted Thomas Lindsay to leave his home in Birmingham, Alabama. There were many. He's an easygoing person, not inclined to negative thoughts, but those incidents, one by one, had a cumulative effect. There was the time in high school when he was arrested while working a summer job cleaning offices. He was accused of stealing money from, from an office. Police threatened to beat a confession out, out of him, but he wouldn't admit to something he didn't do, he said. Eventually, the white family that employed his mother interceded on his behalf, and he was released. On another occasion, his mother's employer was a source of mistrust. He occasionally mowed the family's lawn on weekends. One day, the woman of the house asked him if he would clean some windows inside the house. He agreed. He entered a room and saw $2 bills on the floor. His mother told him he was being tested. He left the money where it was. After high school, but still living at home with his mother, Lindsay invited a friend over for dinner. After dinner, he walked his buddy to the bus stop so he could return home. But they were stopped by police and questioned. Eventually, officers let them go, but the incident angered him. I told my mama, I can't take this no more, he said. If you was raised in the South, when it came to white people, you always had trouble. Fortunately for Lindsay, he had an aunt who lived in New England. Although his mother only had a sixth grade education, her sister graduated from Miles College, a private black college in Birmingham. After graduating, she moved to New England to escape the career limitations that even college educated black people had in the South. She lived initially in Rhode Island, then after her marriage dissolved, moved to Boston. Lindsay visited her there twice. She showed him around the city. She took him on a cruise to Cape Cod. They visited Harvard University. I liked Boston, he said. Lindsay moved to Boston in 1951. He got a job at a candy manufacturer in Cambridge. His high school sweetheart moved to Boston and they married. They eventually had five children and were married for 60 years. In the 1960s, Lindsay got a job at Cambridge-based Polaroid, the company that revolutionized photography with its instant cameras. Polaroid has been called a juggernaut of innovation, the Apple computer of its day. Lindsay worked at Polaroid for 21 years and it enabled him to achieve a middle-class lifestyle. He and his wife owned their home. They sent their kids to college. They took vacations every year, cruises, trips to Europe. He and his friends golfed at different courses around New England. Lindsay's residential locations in Boston demonstrate how the decisions of black migrants like him dramatically altered the racial makeup of Boston's neighborhoods. In the 1950s, he and his wife rented an apartment in a Dorchester neighborhood inhabited mostly by Jewish families. As soon as Blacks moved in, he said, they moved out. From 1950 to 1960, Dorchester's Black population increased 1,360%. About 1970, his Polaroid income enabled him to buy a single family house in Hyde Park. He still lives there. Hyde Park was predominantly white at the time but its black population increased tenfold in the 70s. The house was a step up. He lives on a dead end street. He has a yard. He lives a block away from a large area of hilly woods that has been proposed for development as a park. God has been good to me since I've been up here, he said. Black migration was not always the product of long simmering discontent. Sometimes the factors that brought it about were more subtle and unexpected. 
Sometimes people didn't even realize what was happening. When Lucy Parham graduated from high school in 1956 in Morven, North Carolina, she thought she knew what her future held. She planned to enter college that fall. She had every intention of staying in North Carolina. She had a good life there. But after graduating in May, she traveled to Boston for the summer to help out an aunt who was pregnant. She planned to return in time for college in the fall. Parham's aunt already had two children. Lucy took care of them during the day. But her aunt suffered a gallbladder attack after she gave birth, which caused Parham to stay in Boston longer than she originally planned. In September, her aunt's two older children went to school. Lucy continued to help her aunt at night and on weekends, but she got a job as a seamstress during the day. She returned to North Carolina that Christmas time. She decided to postpone college until the new school, school year began the following fall. So she looked for a job. She discovered to her discouragement that the only jobs open to black women like her with a high school education were for domestic work. In her seven months in Boston, Parham began to notice differences between the city and the South. A wider variety of jobs were open to her. Black, pe black people could go anywhere they wanted. She also met her future husband. After her difficulties finding work in, New York, in North Carolina, she decided to return to Boston. I had begun to like it here, she said. Parham did well. In 1958, she married and she and her husband quickly had two children. When she returned to work, she got a job at Gillette, the South Boston razor manufacturer. Gillette had few black employees at the time, but that was changing. The company signed on to a voluntary state program to increase minority hiring. It participated in a hiring fair at Freedom House, a Roxbury nonprofit that sought to improve opportunities for black workers. Parham went to college part-time while she worked at Gillette. She eventually earned a degree in business management which enabled her to get a job in marketing at Gillette. She ended up working at Gillette for nearly four decades. Her husband also got a job there. Ironically, Parham experienced more overt racism in Boston than she ever did in the South. Her biggest problems occurred during the busing years, which divided the city and stimulated significant violence. Once she had a beer can thrown at her, her daughter was bused to Hyde Park High School and Lucy had a confrontation with a teacher there. She telephoned her daughter's teachers at the beginning of the school year, asking them to call her if her daughter had any problems. She was working the night shift, she told them, so she could easily be reached during the school day. One teacher gave her a failing grade, but never called Parham. Lucy scheduled a meeting with the principal and the teacher. When she asked the teacher why she didn't contact her, the teacher replied, I didn't have time. Indignant, Parham replied, you are a teacher? and you're getting paid out of my tax money, and you don't have time to call parents? Parham demanded the principal address the situation and warned him that if he didn't, she would go over her, his head. Parham said of the teacher, she was racist. Racism made Ali Sumrall a homebody. Sumrall grew up in Quitman, Mississippi, in a county with a violent racial history. Multiple black people had been hanged from an abandoned bridge south of town. During the civil rights movement, police attacked black marchers with clubs. Flyers promised to kill any black people who demonstrated. Whitman was rigidly segregated. White owned restaurants forbade blacks from their dining rooms and typically had a single table in the kitchen where they had to eat. Blacks had to sit upstairs at the local movie theater. Sumrall responded to the racial climate different than other people. Only once did he eat in a restaurant kitchen. He chose to never do that again. As he became more socially aware in high school, he stopped going to the movies. If he went to the grocery store to pick up something for his parents and a white person spoke harshly to him, he simply left without buying whatever he came for. He rarely left home except to go to school and church. That was intentional. Staying at home was a defense mechanism. His dad farmed and during the week, Ollie would go to school come home, work in the fields until dinner, and then go to bed. It was safe there at the house, he said. Once Sumra was old enough to leave Mississippi, he did. In June 1959, one month after graduating high school, he moved to Boston. He had a brother and sister who lived there. His brother was stationed at Fort Devens in the Boston suburbs during World War II. 
After his military service ended, he decided to remain in the city. His story was typical of many black men who first experienced life outside the segregated South while in the military. Many of them chose to remain in the North after their service ended. Sumrall continued to be a homebody in Boston and the racially motivated fears he developed in Mississippi, Mississippi continued to shape his behavior. He moved in with his brother's family in Roxbury. He lived with them for a decade. They lived on Warren Street. He got a job at a restaurant on the same street. He later joined Charles Street AME Church, also on Warren Street. He didn't stray far from home. One day, he, one day when he was working at the restaurant, a white woman who was eating there became friendly with him. She asked him if he would like to go to a movie sometime. What a change that represented from his life in the South where black males were taught to avoid all interactions with white women. They knew that if you even looked at a white woman in the wrong way, you could end up dead. Even though he had left the South, the racial code Sumrall learned there was still imprinted on his psyche. He never went out on a date with the woman. I did, it didn't feel right, he said. Sumrall met his first wife in the mid-1960s and they married in 1968. They had two kids, but the marriage didn't last because she liked to go out and I didn't, he said. He married again in 1972. His second wife was a homebody like him. They remained married for more than 30 years until her death. With only a high school education, Summerall always worked blue collar jobs in Boston. Eventually he became a security guard at Roxbury Community College. He worked there for 26 years. In Summerall's more than six decades, in Boston, he has always lived in Roxbury or Dorchester in the heart of the black community. He likes it there. He has never considered living anywhere else. All but one of his jobs was also located in that part of the city. Like other people featured in my book, he socializes mostly with other Southerners. Both of his wives also grew up in the South. His neighbors are also Southern migrants. He has chosen to remain in Boston's black community because he says it reminds him of the South minus the white people. I can avoid them here, he said. Migrants move for all sorts of reasons, but a paramount factor in shaping where they go is the presence of family. Migration is easier if you know someone on the other end. Family may provide a migrant a place to live. They may help them find work. They may lend them money until they get established. They provide love and support in what can be a difficult time. Eight of 10 people in this book, in my book, moved to Boston because they had family who were already there. Elizabeth Hall Davis would likely never have moved to Boston if her mother hadn't preceded her. She may never have left the South since she had a good job there. Davis was a school teacher and there was no more respected op occupation for black women in the South at the time when most still worked as domestics. She and her husband owned a home. They had a nine-year-old son. She was secure in her career, having worked as a teacher for 14 years. Davis didn't move to Boston until she was 33 years old, five years older than anyone else in my book. Rates of migration tend to diminish with age and as adults have children. Her mother moved to Boston about 1950 to work as a domestic. Davis visited her mom in the city. I want you near me, her mother told her. Elizabeth dismissed the idea. I got a job, she said. I'm not going to find a job up here because they're not hiring Blacks. As late as 1963, only 1% of teachers in Boston schools were Black, and its teacher exam was notoriously difficult. Scholars have argued that that exam was used to weed out Black teachers. But her mother persisted in trying to convince Elizabeth to move, to move north. She said, Boston is a better place. You'll find a job, Davis recalled believing what she said, I came. Davis resigned her teaching position in 1963 and moved to Boston. She was pregnant and gave birth that October. She took and passed the teacher exam, then accepted a job in 1964 at the Christopher Gibson School in Dorchester. She taught third grade there for a decade. Despite her reluctance to move to Boston, she immediately recognized the benefits. Her first teaching job paid twice as much as she earned in South Carolina. Davis and her family quickly adjusted to life in Boston, in part because her mother preceded her. They made friends easily because her mother knew people in the city. They joined her mother's church, Charles Street AME. 
Elizabeth earned tenure, then moved to the Lucy Stone School in Dorchester. She taught there for more than 30 years. She and her husband bought a large house nearby where she still lives. Perhaps because of her background, Davis has always been disinclined, disinclined to complain or push for change. That has sometimes frustrated her daughter, Danae, who is a college professor. Danae went to school in suburban Wayland as part of an innovative voluntary busing program, the Metropolitan Council for Educational Opportunity, known as METCO. But she said that the way the program was administered at her school was racist. She went to Wayland three years after a judge ordered the city of Boston to institute busing to desegregate its schools. Danae said all the black and brown kids in Wayland were channeled into vocationally oriented courses such as typing, stenography, and woodchop. A guidance counselor even suggested that she apply to a historically black college in Mississippi. But when Danae complained to her mom, she was unmoved. She was happy that I was in Wayland and that I would finish high school, she said. The fact that I wasn't in Boston and whatever turmoil was happening there, I was still safe. That was okay as a goal for her. When Willie Pittman left his rural Alabama home in summer of 1963 with a friend to join a migrant harvesting crew, he had little sense of what his future held. He had no real plans. He was 19, but still in high school. His father reminded him to be back in time for the beginning of school in the fall. Willie had vague hopes of going to college, but never returned to school after the 10th grade. Like most of the people in this book, Pittman had little interest in the careers of his parents. Pittman's families were farmers and he hated it. If you were an uneducated black man in the South, there were few careers open to you. Pittman was raised in Pike County, Alabama, in a part of the South known as the Black Belt, so named because its soils are black, richly fertile, and ideal for cultivation of cotton, but also because black people made up the majority of the population. Unlike most black people in the South, the Pittman family owned a small parcel of land. They raised cotton, corn, and peas. His great-grandfather was the son of a white man and a black woman, which is how they acquired the land. Pittman's mother gained control of the property when all her siblings moved north. None of them wanted to farm either. Pittman's father was injured while harvesting timber, so Willie's mother and the seven kids operated the farm. They did all the work by hand with the help of three mules. It was hard work, Pittman recalled. I don't know how we stood it. I didn't want to be a farmer. Pittman was educated at the all-black Ansley School, built of cinder blocks that had six rooms for 12 grades, two grades sharing each room. It had no indoor plumbing. The textbooks they used were passed down from a nearby white school. They were always two grades behind. Pittman had a brother and sister who lived in Boston. His siblings told him how much better life was in the city than in Alabama. They said there were well-paying jobs for black men, even without an education. When Willie and his buddy left Pike County to join the migrant harvesting crew for that summer job, they went first to Trenton, South Carolina, where they picked peaches. Then they headed to Penyan, New York, to pick tomatoes and conquered grapes. He looked at a map one day and discovered he was only about six hours from Boston. He had some money in his pocket, so he got a ride to a Greyhound bus station, bought a ticket, and boarded a bus headed east. It was a spur of the moment decision. He didn't intend to stay in Boston, only to visit his siblings, but he never left. He moved in with a sister, got a job painting houses. He'd work a job for a few months until he found something better. In 1966, he was hired by Gillette, benefiting from government programs to increase the hiring of black workers. Pittman worked for Gillette for 35 years, gradually working his way up to better paying positions with more responsibility. He married and he and his wife had two children, both of whom went to college. They bought a house in Brockton. His story shows that migration is not always a carefully planned strategy. Sometimes it just happens, but even when it does, it can have beneficial results. The stories in my book demonstrate that many black people man managed to develop good lives in the South, even in the face of racism and limits on everything they did. The presumption that life in the region was unbearable for black people simply wasn't true, but it was worse for some than others. 
Geraldine Walker's childhood in Alabama was traumatic. She still goes to therapy because of what happened to her there. Walker has struggled in Boston more than anyone else in my book. She never developed a long-term career. She's never made much money. It's impossible not to wonder if all that happened to her in Alabama is part of the reason. She grew up in rural Clay County, Alabama, one of seven children. Her father was a sharecropper. They lived in a former slave cabin. Sharecropping was little better than slavery. Sharecroppers farmed for a share of the income from what they produced, but the landowner provided them seed and other provisions on credit. So by harvest time, they were often so deep in debt that they never made a penny. Walker's family was very, very poor, she said. She had two pairs of shoes, one for school, one for church, but she had to go barefoot the rest of the time. Her mother made her dresses from old flower sacks. She and her family were mistreated in everything they did. When she and her siblings got off the school bus, white kids threw rocks at them. Once her mother suffered burns over 90% of her body, but her family was not allowed to visit her in the segregated hospital. Her father worked hard so he could buy his own land, even making bootleg liquor. To intimidate him, the Ku Klux Klan burned a cross in the family's yard when Geraldine was 10. That took me for a ride for years, she said. Walker stopped going to school after the eighth grade because she said, I wasn't learning anything. It was a nasty school. She took a job as a domestic with a white family, but she quit after she was assaulted by the adult son of the family. It was a horrible life, she said. Walker moved to Boston in 1963 when she was 18. Her sister, Maureen, had migrated to Boston several months earlier to work as a domestic. She helped Geraldine and another sister get domestic jobs. She went to work as a live-in domestic for a family in Newton Center. But Walker continued to have difficulties in Boston. She discovered early in her job that, her, that a teenage son was taking money she was sending home to her family. She caught him in the act and he promised to pay her back if she didn't tell his parents. Then one night her employers went out for the evening, leaving their two teenage boys alone. They invited friends over and raided the family's liquor cabinet. They got drunk and started pounding on Geraldine's door. After her assault in Alabama, it frightened her. She quit the very next day. She then worked a series of low-wage jobs. She eventually earned a GED certificate. She trained to be a home health aide, but quit doing that because the state cut the number of hours aides could work, making it difficult to get the work done. She then worked as a lunch monitor at a school. Working at the school inspired her to become a foster parent. That has helped her pay the bills and put food on the table. She says she has fostered 60 children over the last two decades. She remains close to many of them. Working as a foster parent has given her greater satisfaction than anything else she's done. Even though Walker has struggled at times in Boston, she has never regretted moving north. All her siblings eventually moved north, excuse me, eventually moved to Boston too. I've had a great life, she said. I have good friends. I felt like I could accomplish anything I wanted. I came here and my whole life turned around. Barbara Hicks is unusual. She thinks and acts differently than other people. She's never done what she was expected to do. She takes pride in that. One of nine children, she said, I was the one, the seventh child, the different one. Hicks's father was a coal miner and she grew up in two different mining towns in Alabama. She lived in Bradford until high school when the mine, clo when the mine closed. Her parents were strict. She had little free time because she had so many chores to do around the house. The family spent the entire day on Sundays at church. Mom and dad were especially strict with their daughters when it came to boys. They were only allowed to see them at home. Dad sat in the next room. At 9 p.m. promptly, mom banged on the wall to indicate that it was time for them to leave. Hicks's strict upbringing likely increased her desire for independence. Hicks's family moved to nearby Jasper when she was in high school. After graduating, she entered Tuskegee Institute, hoping to become a nurse but she didn't like college. She thought it would bring greater freedom, but colleges in the early 1960s still exerted tight control over undergraduates. She became bored with her classes. I wanted to see the world, she said. There was a strong tradition in migration in Hicks's family. 
Hicks's grandmother moved to Detroit after she divorced. Hicks's oldest brother moved there for college. Two of her sisters also migrated to Detroit. She had several friends who moved to New York to work as domestic. Migrants typically follow family and friends to a destination in a process known as chain migration because it makes the adjustment process easier, but Hicks, with her independent streak, resisted that. She didn't want to go to Detroit. The employment agency that got her friends domestic jobs in New York offered her a job there, but she said no. She wanted to go to Boston. All she knew about Boston, she learned in books. She knew New England was all stony, beautiful, she said. In college, she learned about the Kennedys. Hicks was a true migration pioneer, moving to a city where she'd never been and where she had no family or friends. I'm a leader, she said. I don't follow. Hicks moved to Boston about 1965 to work, in, work as a live-in governess for a prominent family in Brookline. She worked for Peter Fuller, whose father had been governor of Massachusetts. He owned a college, excuse me, a Cadillac dealership on Commonwealth Avenue. Hicks worked for the Fuller family for two and a half years, but was forced to quit because she became pregnant. She met her future husband, Willie Hicks, at an auto repair shop in Roxbury, where one of her friends had taken her car. Getting pregnant so young was definitely not part of her plans. Even though her parents had implored her growing up not to get pregnant, they never taught her how to prevent that. That stunted my growth, she said. Hicks and her husband had two children. Willie, a migrant from South Carolina, eventually opened his own auto body shop and became quite successful. They had plenty of money. They sent their kids to private schools. Barbara sought to emulate the model of Peter Fuller. But her marriage soured and eventually she got divorced. She retained the family home in, in Mattapan. She went to work, working for a company that supplied telephone systems to businesses. Later, she became a home health aide. Her son became a star athlete. He was the first black quarterback at Boston College and now runs his father's auto body shop. Her daughter owns a business in Plymouth. Barbara has come a long way from the dirt road mining camp where she grew up. Boston has been good to me she said. Brunswick, Georgia was different from other deep south cities during the Jim Crow era. Al Kennett, who grew up there, will tell you that. The historical record confirms it. Brunswick gained national attention in 1963 when its school board attempted to implement a voluntary desegregation program at a time when white schools throughout the south were strongly resisting integration. The New York Times wrote a story about the city. The predecessor to PBS produced a documentary about race relations there. Black and white residents lived next door to one another in parts of Brunswick. Most black people owned their homes. The city had already desegregated its library, parks, and lunch counters. The NAACP registered 4,000 black voters there, a larger share of the population than in most Southern cities. For those and other reasons, Kinnett never desired to leave Brunswick. He loved it there. Kinnett was born in Meridian, Georgia, but moved to Brunswick when his mother divorced his father when he was a boy. She raised 12 kids in public housing in Brunswick. With so many children, she sometimes sent some of them to live with, her other, rel with other relatives, but not Al. She came to exert a deep influence over him as a result. Al is like his mother in many ways. He has never smoked or consumed alcohol, just like his mom. He will not swear and is deeply religious, just like she was. He credits his mother with teaching him manners and respect for others. She instilled in him a positive outlook. I'm just like my mother, he said. I never complain. Kenneth was sports crazy from the time he was little. He spent much of his time growing up at Selden Park, a black park and recreation center located just outside the city limits in Brunswick. It became the center of black life in the city. He played football and basketball in high school, helping the football team at the city's black high school win the state championship. After high school, Kennett joined the Air Force and left Brunswick, but intended to return. His high school sweetheart was still there. He figured he would coach sports and get a job related to recreation. Kennett never returned to Brunswick because his mother had a stroke while he was in the military. She moved to Boston to live with one of Al's sisters and undergo therapy. He had three other siblings who also lived in the city. When he was discharged from the Air Force in 1964, he went to Boston too. 
Sometimes people are compelled to migrate by forces beyond their control. Kennett was the only adult migrant in my book who never chose to leave the South or to move to Boston. He only went there because his mom was there. Al moved in with a sister in the South End. He got a job as an orderly, then sent for his high school sweetheart. They married and later had a daughter, though they divorced. Kennett is now on his third marriage. About 1966, Kennett got a job with the Urban League, organizing its recreation program. That began his long career of working in recreation and coaching sports. Two years later, he was hired as a recreation instructor at the Shelburne Community Center, a city-owned facility in Roxbury. He was hired there by Alfreda Harris, a leader in the city's Black community. Kennett worked at the Shelburne Center and other city programs for years. He also worked at the Roxbury Boys and Girls Clubs and coached innumerable teams at every level. People who know Kennett will tell you that he's influenced countless Black kids from low-income neighborhoods. Al was everywhere, Alfreda Harris said. His mother died in 1970, but by then he was already so enmeshed in the sports and recreation culture of Boston that he never considered going home. Even so, he occasionally wonders how his life would have turned out if he had stayed in Brunswick. I missed it. I miss it, he said. The last of our migrants to head north was Elta Garrett, but she did not want to go. She liked her life in Louisiana. She strongly resisted moving to Boston. Garrett grew up an only child in tiny Sun, Louisiana, about an hour north of New Orleans. Her father cut pulpwood and was a musician. Her mother did housework in white homes. Elta's life growing up revolved around school, church, and music, all of which involved her family. Her aunt was the teacher at the Black School in Sun. Elta was a good student and skipped second and fifth grades. Her grandfather was a minister at an AME church, and the family spent all day, every Sunday, at church. Her grandmother was a singer and voice teacher and began teaching Elta to sing as soon as she could talk. She performed her first solo in church at age three. After graduating from an all-Black high school in nearby Bogalusa, Garrett attended Grambling State College, where she studied music, music and trained to be a teacher. When she graduated in 1963, she was hired to teach sixth grade at a black school in Folsom, Louisiana. She met her husband there. In 1968, she was transferred to Covington High School just as schools in St. Tammany Parish were integrating in response to court orders. But her husband wanted to move to Boston. He had two siblings who lived in the city and he hoped to attend college there. Delta had no interest in moving. She thought she might be promoted to assistant principal the following year. She had started taking graduate classes. She wanted to build a house in Louisiana. Garrett's husband moved to Boston before she did. He got an apartment in the South End and brought Elta to visit, but she told him, I'm not moving here. I don't like Boston. Still, it was the 1960s and women were expected to follow their husband's wishes. Her mother told her, you need to be with your husband. In March 1969, Garrett submitted her resignation and begrudgingly moved to Boston. Her adjustment was difficult. She got a teaching job at Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School in Roxbury, but quit after three days because of a lack of discipline at the school. They were burning up teachers' cars in the parking lot, she said. She found the people in Boston cold, a typically sociable Southerner. She was scolded by her husband when she greeted strangers on the street. She and her husband had a son, but, he, but when he was just two months old, her husband walked out on her, moving out without warning while she was at work. He moved to California and remarried. She considered returning to Louisiana, but her mom talked her out of it. Gradually, Garrett began to appreciate Boston. She got another teaching job in 1970 and then ended up teaching in Boston schools for 35 years. She said the people at her church, Charles Street AME, were instrumental in helping her survive the breakup of her marriage. Men in the church provided her son the male guidance he lacked when his father left. In 1976, her mother was seriously injured in a car accident in New Orleans, and Garrett brought her to Boston for treatment. These hospitals here, Garrett said, they literally put her back together. Garrett was also able to fulfill her educational goals in Boston. She ended up earning two master's degrees. She also became an admired singer and was later honored for her singing by Mayor Tom Menino and the New England Conservatory. 
Five decades after moving to Boston, Garrett had finally, has finally adjusted to life in the city, even if it has never felt quite like home. Asked when she finally came around to living in Boston, she joked, yesterday. And that's all I have. I would be happy to take comments, answer questions that people have. So uh, folks, let's give Blake a big virtual round of applause for a, a very, a, a wonderful presentation, very unique, um, uh, highlighting all uh, those individuals. Um, so now is the time, folks, if you have any questions or comments, please get them into the chat and into the Q&A. Uh, Blake, I'll lead us off. So uh, you, you mentioned how tens of thousands of um, uh, Southern Blacks uh, came up to uh, New England uh, and that your book uh, spotlights uh, 10 of them. Uh, how did you choose these particular 10? Well, this, this book actually originally grew out of a much larger um, book that I was working on, on the history of migration to New England, uh, a project that turned out to be maybe too large. Uh, but I became particularly enamored with uh, um, one chapter that I plan to do on Black migration. Uh, and I was aware of the Great Migration and uh, you know, began to do research to see if there had been any significant Southern Black migration to Boston and discovered that there had, you know, looking at, at, at census data. Um, but there's been almost nothing written about the subject, remarkably. And so I began to make contacts with uh, various people in the Black community in Boston, uh, politicians, uh, academics, um, editor of the Black Weekly newspaper in Boston, uh, ministers, uh, to try to um, find people I could interview to enliven that chapter in that book. You know, I was very aware at that time that uh, most of the people that came north on the as part of the Great Migration were getting pretty old. They, you know, all the people I interviewed were in their 80s and 90s. And I knew that if somebody did somebody didn't record some of these stories soon, that they would be lost for forever, and you wouldn't really be able to tell the story that I've tried to tell. So I had had real trouble finding people. Uh, one day, and I don't remember why, I think it was just part of my efforts to find someone who could help me. You know, uh, find some migrants to talk to. I contacted uh, Reverend Gregory Groover, who's the minister at Charles Street AME in, in Roxbury. And finally, I found someone who got it, who, 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 who knew all about the Great Migration because his own parents were both uh, migrants from the South to New York City, who knew that many of his parishioners were uh, Southern migrants. And he offered to help me uh, uh, connect with, with uh, some of them. And everybody in my book is, is, is a ghost of Charles Street AME. So it's kind of an interesting story in itself. Uh, we have uh, one commenter saying a simply outstanding presentation. Thank you. Uh, an another says fascinating vignettes. Thank you. Um, Angelina says very informative. Thank you. I will be reading your book. Uh, let me see here. James would like to know, was the Black newspaper called The Banner? What's the question I, about The Banner? Uh, was, what was the name? Was the Black newspaper, was it called The Banner? Yeah, it's the Bay State Banner. It still exists. Yeah. Uh, Angelina says, thank you. Very informative. Claudia had a similar question than I uh, that I had. Uh, Blake, let me ask you this. Um, can you talk about um, how long it took you to publish the book? And uh, was the uh, was this something that you approached the publisher with or did the publisher approach you with the idea? Uh, no, I approached publishers when a draft of the manuscript was finished. Um, I left academe back in 2017 to return to my first love, newspaper journalism. Uh, that didn't go so well because newspapers are in pretty dire straits these days. And then, then the pandemic ha happened, which made it worse. And at the time, I was uh, living in a, in a rural county in uh, North Texas. Um, when I left New Hampshire, I left most of my research files for that book project with a friend in case I ever decided to go back to them. Uh, but I brought my Black migration files with me because I thought that, you know, that might be something I might be able to turn into a book at a, at a later date. And I'm sitting in my house in, in uh, Scotland, Texas, Archer County, Texas. 
uh, thinking, what the heck am I going to do with my time? Every place is closed. You know, it's, uh, you know, nobody's hiring. And I don't know anybody around here. It's a whole nother story how I ended up there. And uh, I thought, wait a minute, I have those those great migration files. And so I thought, what a perfect time to write the book. So the pandemic really uh, <laughs> got me to do it. Uh, Amir says, this was an excellent presentation. I can't wait to read your book. Thank you. Uh, Grace asks, well, Grace says, thank you for the presentation. And she asks, what role did faith play in their migration? Um, I don't know that it, it, it had anything to do with stimulating the migration, uh, but all of the 10 people in my book, as, as I've already said, are members of Charles Street AME, all would consider themselves to be deeply religious. Uh, in the book, most of them talk about the role of the church in their lives, which has been very significant. Uh, in this kind of abbreviated version of their lives today, I didn't get too much into that. There's much more about that in the book. Um, there's plenty of research that, you know, uh, supports the idea that, that Black Americans in general are much more religious than uh, other Americans. You know, there's lots of data to support that. And, uh, and, and the role Charles Street plays in the lives of these people certainly supports that. So I don't, I don't know that it had it didn't, it didn't have anything to do with their decisions to migrate, but most of them were deeply religious when they left of the South, continued that when, I, when they came North. Uh, so folks, uh, last call for comments and questions as we begin to wrap it up. Uh, Sally says this was fascinating, inspiring. Uh, the stories were courageous. Uh, so wonderful that you are sharing these important stories. Thank you very much. I'm happy to do it. I, I find their stories inspiring as well. Uh, so one uh, commenter asks, uh, did any of the people you interviewed talk about the stresses, the violence, and the struggles of busing in the 1970s? Uh, a number of them did. Um, most of them weren't most of them were affected by the violence in in minor ways. I mentioned uh, um, the story of one of my the people featured who had the confrontation with the the teacher who she felt was racist and didn't call her and when she asked to call her and that that she had a beer can uh, thrown thrown at her. Um, other of my migrants had busing experiences. Uh, almost all of my migrants said that with even still today, they will not go to South Boston because of its association with racism, because of its, uh, you know, role in in much of the violence related uh, 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 to busing. Most of them didn't actually have a lot of bad experiences themselves. They stayed in the black community intentionally, like the the one person I mentioned. Um, they prefer it there. I had a, a one of the people in my book. Uh, a couple of them had, had problems when they went outside the Black community. Uh, Charles Gordon uh, said that he used to play for a Park League football team from Roxbury, that whenever they played a game in South Boston, their bus had to have a police escort. And the South Boston team also had to have one when they play, <laughs> played in Roxbury. Um, another of my uh, migrants talked about, again, it was a sports-related incident where he was... Uh, I think refereeing a football game in Charlestown and had a uh, elderly white man yell, get out of here, nigger, and throw his walker at him. And this was about uh, uh, during the time of, of, of busing. Uh, another one of my migrants who worked at, who worked at uh, Gillette was working the night shift one time during busing. Uh, it was a nice day. He decided to walk home. Uh, and he had a carload of whites pull up alongside of him and threaten him. And he was walking over a ship channel at the time and thought they were going to throw him in. Uh, and he had one of those Afro combs in his jacket pocket. And he quickly thought to point it out through his jacket and not show fear. And they apparently were deceived into thinking that maybe he had a gun. So they left. Um, they all talked about busing. Uh, sometimes they talked about it in a, in a positive sense. Charles Gordon talked about 
uh, busing having a positive influence, especially on the black community, that it made black people much more politically active, which had long term benefits. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, it comes up, busing comes up pretty regularly in my book. I mean, if you talk about race in Boston, it's hard not to talk about uh, 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 busing. I'm reading the new Dennis Lehane book, in fact, right now, which is uh, very good if nobody's read it. And it's uh, set at the time of busing and set in, in South Boston. Uh, here's a fun comment from Judith. Uh, she has a random thought and she says, your voice sounds a lot like Kevin Costner. Have you ever gotten that before, Blake? <laughs> I have not. I've never heard that before, no. <laughs> there you go. People used to say when I was younger that I looked like, oh, what was that actor that was in like Ordinary People? He was a very prominent actor for a while. Can't remember his name. People used to tell me I looked like him, but nobody's ever told me I sound like Kevin Costner. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, now that she uh, wrote that, now I can totally see it. Um, let me see. Robert, uh, who was it? Donald Sutherland, uh, Timothy Hutton, Jude. Timothy Hutton, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Timothy Hutton, yeah. yeah people um, used to talk about that all the time, and it never, I never got it, but. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and uh, let's see. We'll end on this question from a vet. Uh, what's next for Blake and what other subjects do you plan to write about? Uh, I, uh, after I finished writing my, the book manuscript, uh, I actually took a job teaching high school on the Navajo reservation in New Mexico. And I'd long had an interest in, in uh, native groups. In fact, part of that book that I've alluded to, you know, there was going to be a section there on uh, uh, native groups in New England. Uh, Anyway, the teaching up there for a year uh, increased my interest in the Navajo. As a geographer, I, whenever I move someplace, I jump in feet first and want to know everything I can about the people in the place. So I immediately set out to read everything I can about the, the Navajo. And that, that has increased, even though I don't teach up there anymore. And I'm currently working on a book project about the Navajo, uh, particularly about a very famous, the most famous uh, historical event in Navajo history, something called the Long Walk, where they were forcibly removed from their homeland and essentially moved to a prison camp uh, in, in eastern New Mexico. Uh, and it's attempt to, and it's, it's, it's a subject that's been written, a lot's been written about, uh, but very little has been written that is told from a Navajo perspective. Now, I'm not Navajo, obviously, but you know, one of the problems is this, this occurred in the 1860s. There was no written Navajo language until the early 20th century. Um, and so people that write about the long walk and everything that led up to it uh, are forced to rely almost exclusively on white people said, on what white people said. And, and it, it Nobody's really ever tried to look at it more from a Navajo perspective, and that's what I'm trying to do in this, this project. So that's um, that's what I'm that's what's occupying my time now. Beyond that, I don't have any other immediate plans. I've thought of doing a uh, something similar in a way to what I what I've done in North to Boston, and I, I'm very much attracted to writing about ordinary people. Uh, I don't think. Uh, we pay enough attention to ordinary people in their lives. You know, there's any number of books on movie stars and politicians and, but you know, we don't, we don't know much about regular people like us. Uh, and I've thought of, uh, you know, doing a, doing a book of, of stories about ordinary New Mexicans. I, I live in El Paso, but I'm just, I'm very close to New Mexico and I will probably eventually return to New Mexico because I love it there. And, uh, Texas sometimes gets on my nerves. <laughs> um, yeah. so I, may, I may work on that someday as well, but we'll see uh, one thing at a time. So uh, folks, let's give Blake uh, one more virtual round of applause. Um, uh, so folks, uh, those who are listening live, uh, look for an email for me tomorrow with a link to a feedback survey, a link to the recording, uh, information about some other upcoming virtual author visits that might be of interest uh, as well as a link uh, to purchase a copy from Wellesley Books. Um, I wanted to end with uh, Grace's comment. She said, thank you again. This is history that we all should learn more about. 
And Thank Blake, uh, before I end the session, do you have any last words for us? Well, I would just like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, support your local libraries. I'm a former li librarian. There's uh, one of the great things about this country is libraries that they still exist. So uh, support your libraries. That's a good note to end on. Uh, so thank you so much, Blake. Uh, thank you all for watching and uh, we'll see some of you soon. Thanks again. Thank you. Take care, everyone.